All right, YouTube, it is Mr. Mean coming at you on this very overcast 27 degrees Fahrenheit, Duluth, Minnesota. We uh, we are got a little bit of cold going on here. Uh, of course, it is January 6th, 2019. I hope everybody had an amazing Christmas and a happy new year. And then more importantly, everybody was safe and sound. So, uh, today, it's Sunday, it is currently 1.30ish, my son is laying down taking a nap, my wife is laying down taking a nap, and I thought I would put out a video because Mr. Mean got called out. Mr. Theophrastus Bombastus posted, and I quote, I followed his link from drive through expecting to find the advertised review Instead, I find a video of him simply gushing over his delivery and discussing his life. I am happy for you. Don't get me wrong, close parentheses, but not what I came for. So thumbs down, I'm afraid. On a brighter note, if you make a review in the future or if you have, in fact, made one already, hit me with a reply and I'll be sure to give it a watch. Well, Mr. Theo Theophrastus, calling you out, buddy. Here's the review. Um, I realized uh, that Mr. Theophrastus makes a very good point here because all I am doing is I went back and I watched a video and it wasn't a review. It was just me gushing over the softback copy of the book. Um, and I thought that I had done a review of DCC because it is one of my one of my favorite OSR uh uh, RPGs for, for Dungeons and Dragons or fantasy. Um, and it's really kind of a, it's not really an OSR. It's, it's in between because it's something new, something old and something different. And what's great about DCC, if you've ever played an OSR clone, it's very simple. If you've played D and D fifth edition or fourth edition, there's some complexities in it and it's fun and everybody likes it. But DCC gives you some grim, dark, dare I say, perilous adventure. Um, but yet in the tropes that we're all used to, um, and it's, uh, put out by Goodman Games. It is readily available. P this is the PDF copy, as you can see on the screen here. I am a grognard though, and I have the fourth print. This is third or fourth. I don't even remember. Jeez, it's so many. Uh, oh, it's a fantastic book, by the way. This is the hardback. I have the softback as well which I did a review of. This is 2012. I believe this is the third, pr the fourth printing of it. Uh, it doesn't say. I was hoping it would say. Uh, oh, it doesn't say. I think, I think this is the third printing. It doesn't say. Um, anybody knows, please post in the comments below. Um, this is the, the screen. Uh, oh, that's the back. There's the front. Same as the PDF. I have the PDF. I believe that's the fourth edition. Um, and, of course, I have an unboxing video where I unbox the Kickstarter that I, I did where we got the Uber cool box and the, the leather cover and everything. Um, mine was damaged in shipping, um, and the guys from Goodman did reach out to me. They did watch my video. I proved that you know I wasn't trying to get something for free, and I proved that it was damaged and the ink was the leather was slightly ripped and the ink was smeared or something. I think it happened in the printing process is really what happened. Um, but unfortunately, they didn't have enough copies to replace everybody who had damaged copies. And I did tell them that I can live with it. They reached back out to me and said, hey, what can we do to make it up to you? And I said, well, you know what? Another set of dice would be awesome because DCC dice are sometimes hard to come by. Um, and they didn't even blink. Sent them to me right away. So awesome. I am a member of the band, of the road crew. Uh, I'll, I will be running demos in 2019 at conventions as I get to them. Um, this is a great, great game to run at conventions. Um, you can now order this off of the... Uh, web store. This is the Dungeon Crawl Classic GM screen. It's very thin. Um, these things are like gold. They were giving them away back in, I think, 2015 or 2016 as um, as promos for uh, for going to uh, RPG Day. Uh, some of your bigger game stores do RPG Day, and uh, Goodman Games always tries to support RPG Day. So, obviously, fun times had there. So, if you can catch one of these, pick them up. It's totally worth it. But I just wanted to show the physical copies. But we're gonna we're gonna look at the PDF because 
uh, Theophrastus, if I said your name right, I if I said it wrong, I'm sorry. But uh, this is a shout out to you, sir. Uh, a little housekeeping out of the way. Uh, there'll be links in the in the doobly doo down below for uh, my MeWe or Patreon. Uh, please come by and support me. It helps out the channel. Any money I make off of Patreon, I throw right back into the channel. It's what paid for this awesome uh, snowball mic in my C920 uh, or 960, whatever it is, 1080p uh, camera for uh, Logitech and my spanky new monitor here, which you guys can't see, but I can see it. It's awesome. Um, but anyway, and then of course, for all those glorious RPGs in the back there. So uh, big shout out to Theophrastus. Uh, thanks for calling me out on it, buddy. So here is my review and thoughts of a grognard, Mr. Mean Speaks on Dungeon Crawl Classic 4th Edition. So here we have, this is the cover of the PDF. Um, if you don't own the PDF, I recommend you get it. It is phenomenal. Um, it's great. Uh, this is a chunky book, um, obviously. Uh, but the nice part is this is all you need to buy. Um, you don't have to buy any other splat books if you don't want to. Uh, there's a ton of adventures out there. Um, any of your old AD&D adventures will work with this. Uh, your basic D&D adventures will work. But of course, these guys, Goodman Games, has went ahead and produced a whole bunch of uh, and reprinted some classic adventures and converted them to DCC or Dungeon Crawl Classic. So, um, Glory Gold won by Sorcery and Sword. Um, the best part of this is what's on the back of the book. Um, and it, I, it's either in the back or in the end. Yeah. You're no hero. You're an adventurer, a reaver, a cut purse, a heathen slayer, a tight-lipped warlock guarding long-dead secrets. You seek gold and glory, winning it with sword and spell. Caked in the blood and the filth of the weak, the dark, the demons, and the vanquished. There are treasures to be won deep underneath, and you shall have them. DCC is a complete role-playing game of 1970s Appendix in Fantasy. There you go, folks. That says it all right there. So, why DCC when there's so many OSR clones and there's, of course, ADD uh, and there's everything else out there that you could play? Lamentations of the Flame, uh, Flame Princess. Um, uh, there's, there's tons of them. That's the one that comes to mind right off the bat. Um, there is a flavor to DCC that no other fantasy RPG invokes, and it's because of the art. The art in these books is fantastic, um, and it definitely sets up this dude being eaten by a worm. I mean, how fucked is that? And the knight's like, yeah, I'll get to him when I can. Uh, I mean, the art is just very invocative. Goodman Games has pretty much... This is their bread and butter. This and Mutant Crawl Classic, which is the sci-fi version of this. Um, so if you want lasers and pew-pew, then go check out MCC, Mutant Crawl Classic. But there's the DCC RPG. Um, GoodmanGames.com is where you can go to buy this. You can also get it off a of drive through RPG. Um, this mixes, and it says it right there, fourth printing. Right there. Boop, boop. Fourth printing. So I was correct. Um what is nice about this is it mixes the original D and D with a little bit of fourth and fifth edition and some 3.5. Uh, we have saving throws, you know, which be became more popular in the 3.5, 3.0, 3.5 edition of D and D. It was in original D and D as well, but this is more of the 3.5 version. What makes DCC set apart is the uh, um, lack of complexity. This is an easy game to pick up and run. There's not a whole ton of, there's not a, a, a crap ton of rules. This is old school D and D pick up some dice and chuck them. Um, GMs are encouraged, encouraged to keep a binder of the dead PCs that they have killed. The other great part about this is you don't just make a level one character and you go out into the world to seek your fame and fortune. Oh no, my friend. You are hewn from the salt of the earth. You are molded by the clay of the land that molt that made you. You start out as a zero level, zero level peon, a nobody, a serf, a muckracker, nothing. You have barely two coppers to rub together to call your own. They have a very unique character creation process. Uh, on average, you will make four, four 
zero level PCs and you will run them through what's called a funnel. As far as I know, DCC is the only game that does this. Um, maybe the others do, but I'm not familiar with them. I don't, I don't even own a copy of Lamentations of the Flame, if I'm saying it right, uh, Flame Princess or Fiery Prince, whatever it is. Although it is one of the ones that's on my list to get. I'm scrolling through some of the art here in the beginning of the book so you can get a feel for it. Um, there you go. Um, but you make your character... Um, you make these four zero level characters and then from those four characters you as a player will get with your GM and hopefully three to six I've run this with as many as eight players each running three characters so 24 peons running through a dungeon and it's a blast it's so much fun uh, I, if you ever get a chance to play it and you're curious or on the fence take Mr. Mean's advice and go sit in on a convention game and you'll have a good time. Uh, it's There's something cathartic about having the GM stamp dead on one of your characters or take a red pen and put a line through it. Um, but uh, you you make those, on average, three to four zero-level NP, uh, PCs, peons, and you roll randomly. Everything is random. You, you roll 3d6, that's your stats. And you go down the line and you roll them. There's no placing them where you want. There's no, oh, re-roll ones and twos or roll 4d6 and take the highest three. No, 3d6, that's all you get, buddy. Um, and then you roll randomly for what your character is. Um, there's no races. You, if you roll, uh, if you want on character generation, if you roll a dwarf, you're a dwarf. Um, and most likely you'll probably be like a dwarf miner or something. As you can see, it goes into character creation they repeat that same little verbiage from the back of the book again. The art, again, is fantastic. So here's your here's your basic character creation. You roll your ability scores. You, desert, you determine your zero-level occupation. Choose an alignment. Purchase equipment. You won't have much money, trust me. But it is encouraged to let the players pool their money so that they can buy better equipment. And to haggle, because remember, you know we're trying to strive for a medieval fantasy uh, environment here. A lot of haggling and trade was done back in the day. Because, um, yes, you can start with a sheep, or maybe even if you're lucky, a chicken. And let me tell you, a chicken is great for finding pressure traps. Um, uh, attempt to survive your first dungeon. If you survive and reach 10 XP, which once you finish your funnel, if you survived it, you automatically get 10 XP. And you are now a level 1 character. You level your character up. So you're going to get some more hit points. An average character is going to start with anywhere from 1 to 4 hit points. Plus or minus any bonuses they get from their constitution. Probably not much. You will chew through characters like there is no tomorrow. But that is part of the fun. And then whatever survives. And you'll see players... Uh, typically, we're, we're, we're taught in role-playing games to become attached to our characters and to try to protect them as best we can. But when you're running four characters through a funnel, and it's basically a meat grinder, grinder it's kind of hard to get attached to one of these four plebes that are, for the most part, all of them are relatively useless. Um, they usually have some some aspect of them that's that's good but uh, i've seen some horrendous rolls on dice rolls a lot of times when i run the game i will have everybody make characters right then and there because it's relatively fast um purple sorcerer games.com or purple sorcerer.com is a great website it's a it's a uh, utility website they do make an app that you can buy for your phone excuse me <coughs> and you can uh you can do pre-gens and it'll even print it out on, on an 8.5 by 11 with four characters with all the gear and everything and it's all random. So I, I'll do that a lot as well and print those out and then I just, everybody rolls. I'll put numbers on them and depending on how many players we have, I have everybody roll a d20 and that's because it doesn't make a difference to pick. N most likely none of them or maybe if you're lucky one or two will survive. And you always want to have extras because someone's going to lose all their characters. Um, and then you just you go for it, man. And it's uh, here's your ability score modifier. As you can see, it's a little bit different from like 3.0 or 3.5 or anything currently today. Um, it uses the funky dice, as it's called. Uh, everything from a D3, D4, D5, D6, D7, D8, D10, D12, 14, 16, 20, 24, and a 30. 
Um, and you can see your, if you're a wizard, you get certain spells uh, based on your level. Your luck, your luck score. And you roll a d30, and this is, you get, it's just whatever it is, it is. Saving throws is pretty much cut and dry. It's just like it is in, in most other versions of D&D. Um, uh, fortitude, reflex, and willpower to make to make a saving throw. The character rolls a d20, adds any modifiers, plus or minus, and compares the result to a target number DC. If the result is equal to or greater than DC, the save is made. If not, dire effects may ensue. That's another word of saying you're flucked. Here's your occupation table. This is what you're going to roll on. As a zero-level character, this is what you get. You get 1d4 hit points modified by stamina. And yes, you can start with a minimum of one hit point. I've seen it happen many times. 5d12 copper pieces, 0 XP, one randomly determined piece of equipment, see table 3-4, uh, one randomly determined occupation, which is table 1-3, uh, possessions of one weapon and training in its use. So... If you have a pair of shears, that counts as a dagger. So you you know how to use a dagger, you know how to use shears, so on and so forth. Um, you have a plus zero modifier to your attack rolls and all saving throws. Note that zero level characters use a crit die of 1d4 on the crit table. That is one of the great things about this game is that you'll see a lot of reference to tables. There's tables for uh, the clerics, there's tables for the wizards, there's a table for the thief, there's a table for the warrior. Um, this game relies heavily on crit tables and and monsters have crits as well so it goes both ways um and so a lot of the book is taken up by those tables um and the wizard the wizard and the clerical clerical section is not so big the wizard section is huge because you make a skill roll but we'll get into that as we get closer so here's your professions you roll d100 and you find out what you're going to be and what you get um so here, and this also tells you your occupation. So you don't get to pick like you do in D and D or Palladium Fantasy or uh, Pathfinder. Like I want to be a, I want to be a dwarven, you know, and then choose a, a, a an occupation or whatever. It's rolled here. So if you roll a twenty two, you are a dwarven herder, and you get a staff, and you have a sow. Yes, you have a cow. Um, or a pig. A sow is a. I think a sow can be. I don't remember if it's a if it's a pig or a cow. I think it's a pig. It's been so long. I don't remember. Uh, but yeah, there you go. And you can be a wizard's apprentice. Uh, you can be a woodcutter. I mean, you can be anything. Uh, there are some elven stuff in here. So twenty nine through thirty eight, you can be an elven of some kind: a falconer, a chandler, a barista, an artisan, uh, a farmer. Oh no, a sage, navigator, glassblower. Um, and then you have all this stuff. Never underestimate this stuff. It comes in handy. And players will find ingenious uses for it. So your weapon training, you're assumed to be trained in the basics of a weapon. Um, this is Chaos Warrior back in the day. Um, level advancement. So when you hit your 10 XP, you become level 1. Then in order to hit level 2, you have to get 50 XP. So it doesn't use the traditional... Um, level cap that like D, &D uses or pathfinder it, it's similar but obviously it's a lot lower um characters even at level one die like you wouldn't believe and if you run uh a couple of the level one adventures even tell you to run players let players choose three or four characters to run so there's your cleric you choose a class um this is what you get to choose after you finish your funnel so any of those characters that survive you get to decide what they're going to be. So obviously if you roll an elven, uh, you know, whatever, and you want to be a wizard, you could choose to be a wizard. You want to be a dwarven, you know, you can stick with whatever it is and you can become a dwarven fighter or a dwarven cleric, whatever. All the gods, uh, some of them are pretty familiar. Some of them are maybe a little different than what you're used to, but they're there. And there's all your spell checks and everything for your clerics. Um, so it goes into it and then your thief... Um, weapon training, your hit points, so on and so forth. Everything that happens. The art in the book is phenomenal. It's very well done. Um, here's your thief skills. Um, this is not a game that relies heavily on skills. The skills default to the attributes. 
and then you just roll whatever whatever your bonus is for your attribute and that's what it is the thief is the only exception to that rule where they have a couple of different skills based on the type of thief that you are if you're a lawful thief you're going to you're going to get access to these skills here if you're a chaotic thief you're going to get access to these skills here so it just kind of depends on where you're going um so obviously your thieves are your your uh your skill users in the game the mages have some skills but not a whole lot warriors i don't think get any skills uh because well a warrior's job is to go beat shit up and so here you go your attack modifiers your warriors also get and they they give titles for everybody which is a it's funny um but it's pretty cool you get an, a deed die for the warrior which at first level is an extra d3 so you roll your d20 and you roll a d3 and play, placed on modifiers and stuff like that you could actually hit twice um and then you go there your threat range obviously for a warrior is better than all the other classes because you're made to be up close and, and personal uh your crit die and the table uh this is the die that you roll in this case a first level warrior rolls a 1d12 for his crit die and he rolls on table three and then of course they, it gets better so obviously the higher the table the better the crits are so if you're a 10th level and again, only 10 levels in this game. Really don't go into too much about multi-classing or anything like that. It's assumed at that point you've had enough adventuring. You're basically a god when you get to 10th level. You retire or you go off to die a glorious death in a big battle. And you make a new character and you start from scratch. Um, this is one of those games that um, campaign play is pretty fun. I've, 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 I've got to play in a short campaign. Um, and I think I got to level three and I, I played a wizard and it was a blast. Um, but it's definitely a game that really lends itself to, a, a short term campaign, you know, and if the DM wants to give out a decent amount of XP so that everybody can level up real quick, it can be crazy fun. Um, you have different orders and stuff. They give you some role playing. There's not much of world building in this book. It's all basically mechanics and rules, um, there's a number of source books out there or you use your own uh, rules that you want all the different uh, demons and, and common patreons that you'll invoke as a wizard um, and then your your titles and everything for a wizard and then your levels you can see their crit die and they're only they only ever roll on table one which is the lowest crit crit table which means it it doesn't it's not as spectacular as like crit table five which the warrior rolls on when he gets high enough level um but you can see your action die and then you get multiple actions when you hit fifth level so you can roll a d20 and a d14 so you could do two actions and you might you might hit with both as you can see you get a note two plus two attack uh and it goes on from there and then your spells your max level spells and then your saves um so pretty similar there i mean this looks very similar to like 3.5 or fourth edition or fifth edition dnd um, wizards in this game are brutal then you go into your because remember you don't get to pick your race you roll on a table and you get what you get but if you roll a dwarf here you go at each level a dwarf gains 1d10 hit points um, and you know you go here's your dwarf so if you rolled one of those dwarves and when you created your zero level character when you hit level one you come here and then you decide what you're gonna be um, elf is the same way you know and there's all your choices and everything and it just just doesn't look good i don't care what's going on there that's bad um but then you have cool art like this so it goes both ways you know you got some funny stuff here and then you got some crazy stuff here and then you got some normal pretty standard fantasy stuff um halflings halflings are awesome everybody wants a halfling in the party because halflings have luck luck is an expendable burnable attribute that you have in the game halflings can regain their luck where the other races really can't um and they can burn luck to make a roll so say you make you have to make a reflex saving throw and you fail it by one you can burn a point of luck or you can burn an attribute point like wizards can burn attribute points in order to get spells off um you know like wizards don't obviously put a lot of faith in strength so it's not uncommon to run into a wizard that's a uh, level two or three wizard that has like a strength of four because they've been burning those strength points in order to succeed at, at summoning or spells so here's all the information for our halfling then we go into skills and like i said 
it talks about how the reason there's not a whole big list of skills. Look, it's two pages of skills. That's it. Everything breaks down off of your attribute checks. And then you go into your equipment. It's pretty standard there. Armor class, mighty deeds. Uh, here's your crit tables. Crit table one, all zero level characters and all wizards. So at 20, at the best you can roll, 20 plus, you get a lucky blow, dense foe's skull, and inflicting plus duty six damage with this strike. If the foe has no helm, he suffers a permanent loss of 1d4 intelligence. Yes, that is a very common thing in, in DCC. You can have negative attributes because you can get foobard. So be aware. Combat is uh, brutal in this game. And like I said, character death is very, very common. Um, different critical tables, like I said, they get better. Mounted combat, it kind of goes over it. Mighty Deeds of Arms. This is your warriors. They get to do extra things it's their knit with wizards can sling spells thieves can backstab wizard or warriors break shit it's what they do so this is it tells you how to how to perform mighty deeds and uh, how you get to do them and what they get to do for you so it's very cool um burning luck um character can only burn luck to affect his own die rolls except for halflings which is why everybody wants a halfling in the party halflings are noted in their class description luck cannot be burned to affect the die roll of other characters or monsters even if even if they affect the character note that the character's luck modifier does apply to enemy crits against them but this luck modifier is different from burning off luck so there you go uh, one of the things is uh since luck is just that, when you get hit with a critical hit, you can subtract whatever your luck modifier is from the, their critical hit roll so that you don't it's not as deadly. So it's a double-edged sword because you want to use your luck to influence your rolls, but if you burn too much, you may lose a positive modifier and go into a negative modifier, which at that point becomes a positive modifier for the person who's hitting you, whether it be a spell or a melee or a ranged attack or whatever. So, your clerics, of course, can turn undead, and there's a chart here. Spell duels is a big thing in DCC, and it's got its own set of rules. It's pretty cool. Uh, spell check comparison, and tells you the die that you'll use for the damage. Um, so, it's pretty solid there. Uh, counter spell is also a big thing in DCC for your wizards, and it talks about what happens. Um, and then it goes into magic, and we're on page 107, 10, or 103 and 104 now, and we are now in the magic, and it's 90% of the rest of the book is all about this. Um, and then here's your mercurial magic, um, your spell burn actions. Uh, again, wizards can burn attribute points in order to make things work, but unfortunately they have to roll on a table, and bad things can ensue. Uh, and you invoke the gods when you use magic. Um, so basically you get your magic power from a patron. And one of the very first spells that you learn is to invoke your patron. Whether your patron, Cthulhu is one of the patrons. So you can imagine how that's going to go. But the nice part is, is um, you have Mercurial Magic, which is your basic magnet. You have Corruption minor corruption major corruption you can see here is <laughs> this was young bright wizard is going down the road and uh it's starting to go bad right around there but then you can see it gets real bad here and like this guy's got a face in his back so you get all kinds of corruption uh deity's disapproval uh he called on his god one too many times and the wizard the elven wizard didn't do it right that's obviously an umber hulk or DCC's version of an Umber Hulk. And he turned the warrior's head into a chicken. Probably not going to end well for that adventuring party. Or the wizard. I'm say there's the elf right there. Um, but you get disapproval and it's pretty much what you think it is. Then you go into your wizard's grimoire. Which is your spell book. And it goes into everything here. Clerical spells, wizard spells, patron spells. Here is what is neat about playing a wizard or a cleric in DCC. So here's Animal Summoning. Um, it's a level 1 spell. Range is 20 feet. Duration varies. Casting time is 1 round. There's no save. General. The caster invokes animal spirits to summon forth a mundane animal. 
The caster must be familiar with the animal type and have some material remnant to expend in casting the spell, e.g. hair, fall, fur, paw, tooth, whatever. So the material component that will be consumed in the summoning of this spell. So if he doesn't have that, he can't cast the spell. The manifestation, what happens when you cast this spell? You roll a 1d4, uh, an egg shimmers into existence, then hatches into an animal summoned. Two, a flash of dark clouds, and the animal appears. Three, the animal's skeletal appears first, then organs appear, then muscles knit them together, then the skin grows, and then the animal appears. Four, the animal erupts from the ground fully formed. So, it's a little flavor there. Do you have to use that in the game? No. But you roll a 1d4, and boom, that's what happens. And and it's the player can describe that. The GM can d- describe it. If you flub the roll and you get corruption, you get to roll a 1d8, and of course, those things on there happen. If you misfire, meaning you 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 uh, flub your roll and you just don't succeed, you roll there. The corruption is if you critical fumble. Then what happens is you take in most cases your your spell casting ability is intelligence. So whatever your modifier is for intelligence, you're going to roll a d20 and you're going to add it together and you're going to get one of the, you're going to get one of these totals, you know, from either one to thirty two plus. So on a 1, lost, failure, and worse. Roll 1d6 modified by luck, 0 or less. Corruption plus misfire. So again, you refer to these two up here, and that's what happens. Uh, misfire plus patron patron taint. Uh, 1 to 2, corruption. 3, patron taint or corruption if no patron. And 4 plus is a mif- misfire. So you can see what happens. If you roll a 2 to 11, it's a loss. It's lost. It's a failure. So you lose the spell for the day. And you, it, the spell doesn't go off. But then you come down here to 30 plus. Uh, the caster summons a large group of mundane animals. This could be a herd of cattle, a pride of lions, a flock of geese, or a pack of wolves. All animals must be of the same type, and the total hit dice must be 100 hit dice or less. The herd remains for up to a week, though they hunger, thirst, and rest as normal. The animals obey the caster's commands and even undertake suicidal commands or those contrary to their nature e.g. ordering a rabbit to consume meat. Due to the nature of the summoning, the caster cannot directly harm the animals summoned. So, you can imagine the fun that you can have with that. Um, Now, this can get crazy when you get up higher level spells. Here's a cantrip. Uh, You know, these are small spells. Featherfall, obviously, is a great spell. Magic Missile, that's a classic. So, level 1, range 150 feet or more, duration instantaneous, casting time, 1 action, or 1 turn, see below. General, the caster hurls a magical missile that automatically hits an enemy. So this is a go-to spell for a lot lot of magic users and a lot of um, people that do magic, no matter what, what type of magic they do. And DCC doesn't make a strong correlation as to the type of magic, it's just magic. It is flavored and colored by your patron if that makes any sense and you'd have to read the patrons and you choose a patron you can go patronless um and there is there is rules for that but it's it's a little different it's not bad excuse me but sometimes you can't choose a god so you know you just you go patronless until you you find something of course the same things fall in the category here manifestation corruption you know, misfire, you know, if you, you foobar the spell, you got to roll on those tables, um, you know, but if you roll a one, it's lost and failure or worse, roll a 1d6 modified by luck, zero or less, it is corruption plus patron taint plus misfire, on a one to two, it's corruption, on a three, it's patron taint or corruption if no patron, on a four plus, it's just a misfire, so obviously, you're really hoping for a misfire, and this is where you want that luck to be a pos- positive modifier, if at all possible, because you can see most of the rolls is on a 4+, plus. it's just a, a, a misfire. Sometimes it's on a 3+, plus. Uh, but you would much rather prefer a misfire than anything else, because it gets ugly. Um, but you can see, so there you lose the fail, you lose the spell and everything else goes with it. On a 32+, plus, most of these spells cap at a 32+, plus based on you know a d20 roll plus the, the bonuses that you can get at higher levels. But on a 32+, plus, the caster throws 3d4 plus 2 missiles that each do damage equal to 1d10 plus the caster level. So 
if you're lucky enough to be first level, you're doing a minimum of two points of damage for every 3d4 plus two missiles. So worst case scenario, that's five missiles. That's 10 damage um, as a first level spellcaster. And in DCC, that that's that'll that'll kill most player characters two times over. So because you know, remember, it's a 1d4 for hit points to start with, plus or minus your your con bonus or stam I think it's stamina and, and DCC. But needless to say, you're Fubart. Um, and then it goes into everything else. So magic is, to me, and then you get to pick, you get X amount of spells as a magic user. So what can happen here is, obviously this is a lot of text to write down and you don't want people mugging, mugging through your book or if they don't have a book. or they, I, That's why I have, I have three copies of these. I have the collector's edition, which doesn't go out of my house. I have the hardback book, which is my book. And then I have a softback book that I keep on the table for the players to use. Um, but if I'm doing a pre-made adventure with level one characters, I will print off their 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 grimoire. Because if you go to purplesorcerer.com, uh, they have the spell book. And you can choose their deity or a player character. You know, if you come and you say, hey, John, I want to play DCC. Uh, and I say, okay, roll a character, and you get a level one wizard, you can go over to purplesorcerer.com, and you can choose your deity. You can even do it all randomly, and it will print out your spells and everything. You just print it out on a nice sheet of paper, and you've got these you've got these charts right here for you. You've got everything you need in order to uh, play your wizard. So as you can see, there's a lot of spells in here, um, and it's obviously alphabetical, and it goes... We're already on page 225. We started on like 104. So it's quite uh, quite in-depth um, because every page, every spell has a page or two of uh, everything. Like <laughs> throwing a spider. That's awesome. Uh, and just crazy spells. And here we go into Quest and Journeys, which is a hero answers his calling, be it to the travels of his duchy or an, an ocean-traversing escapade um and then it talks a little bit about the world it pretty much tells you there is no world make your own um but the art is invocative you know there's cute little arts down like at the bottom of this or there's this very evocative art of a traveling troop there you know going overland speed security while traveling retainers hirelings and followers the, the game covers a little bit of everything the judges rules to start on page 312 uh, not a whole lot here um, they tell you what's known. They go through some stuff, some charts, and then it goes into the gods. I mean, so three twelve to three twenty one. So nine pages of uh, of goodness. That's it, you know. And it goes patron taint. And it'll give you. So remember when you fumble one of those spells, and one of the options was uh, if you roll a d six and you get the option for patron taint, then you come here and you roll a d6 and that's the taint that you get so it can be it can be crazy stuff here then this is each patron has some spells um so ozzy daka dahaka yeah look this poor guy <laughs> looking more and more like that frog up there but yeah so you get your patron spells you get your patron taint that's why it's kind of good to choose a patron because you get access to that spell you always get that spell um uh, King of the Elfland. Uh, let's see. The Three Fates. Yidgril. The World Root. You know, obviously the big tree. Oh, excuse me, guys. Itha, Prince of Elemental Wind. Uh, cleric Spells. Heroes, Experience Points. Again, it goes into a little bit about luck for the GM. Magic Items. This is There's some crazy stuff in here, kids. And uh, all kinds of good stuff. So again, and then our monsters. You get a quite, quite a uh, thing of monsters in here. Um, so definitely enough to get started out. But again, the nice part about DCC is you can snag monsters from fifth edition or fourth edition or 3.0 or 3.5 or AD and D, and the conversion process is not terribly difficult. Um, but for the most part, they cover all the gambit of the basic monsters in here. Um, ape men, basilic, bat, I mean, it's alphabetical. Cave octopus, because, man, come on. Giant centipedes, always a favorite. 
uh, Cyclops, the deep ones, you know, because there's a little Cthulhu in here, Chimera, Cockatrice, uh, dragons, of course. Uh, dragons in here are not the wonderful dragons like they are in D&D where there's good and evil. The dragons in here are just dragons and you are small and crunchy and go good with ketchup. Uh, so you play dragons. The GM plays dragons as he wants them to be. They can be monsters. They can be benevolent demigods or they can just be large monsters out to do their own thing. Um, there's all kinds of stuff in here. I mean, they cover the gambit. You got all your basic monsters. Your demons, you know, that kind of thing. Um, men and magicians. So these are basically uh, NPCs um, that you can deal with. Berserker, fortune teller, a king, peasants, you know, that kind of thing. And then your appendices. This is uh, a different additional information for a thorough judge. Um, this is a lot of good stuff. Curses. Um, You'll, you'll find out that when you run a lot of DC, DCC adventures, um, curses are a big thing. Also, you can be cursed from the gods, especially if uh, uh, some players... I, I did it to a player one time at a convention in Texas. He cursed the gods. And uh, I was like, do you curse any one particular god or do you just curse the guy? He's like, I curse the gods for putting us in this. You know, he was a zero level character. And so I made a roll and uh, I said, you know, I made a D20 roll. And I said, if I, if I roll low... He's going to be cursed by the gods. And then I rolled, um, I think it was a D6 to see how many gods. And I rolled a 6. So all the gods heard him. And they all cursed him in some way, shape, or form. And the way the curse is invoked is once per session, I could roll a D6. And depending on the D6 I rolled, it would be that god. And then I would look at the list of curses for that god. And I would, uh, I would choose something, you know, appropriately, uh, you know. And here's some basic curses right here, um, and I would just zap them. And I'm just this is all the stuff for DCC that's out. It's crazy. OSR resources, uh, languages, you know, inspirational reading, uh, poisons, communities, web forms. Uh, there's all kinds of good stuff on here. Uh, ta table of names, because you know you need names, man. Um, Portal Under the Stars. This is an adventure that is near and dear to my heart. I have run this adventure several times. I don't even need to look at it anymore. I can run it from my head. Um, but basically, uh, the, old, the old village elder who used to be an adventurer uh, tells you that, you know, many years ago, a portal, the stars were right, and a portal opened up, and he tells you to be there you know, at the at the equinox of the stars aligning and to uh, go through the portal and seek your fortune. And so it tells you how to get the players involved. Um, there's the basic map. I recommend printing this on heavy card and just using either dungeon tiles or dry erase mat. And, you know, you can plot it out. This room right here is the most fun room. These are all like terracotta warriors. And uh, no spoilers, but... Uh, You'll have to read the adventure and see there's a giant snake, a demon snake. Um, that thing has given many players fits. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a great adventure. And it's only, it's only like two, three pages. One, two, three, four. It's four pages long. So it's a quick adventure. It's a funnel adventure. Uh, the Abbot, uh, oops. Uh, Abbot of the Woods is uh, one to three uh, levels. Um, it's also a good adventure. It's a little more in-depth uh, because, again, your characters are higher level. But if the, you're running first-level characters, I would let everybody run two. Uh, it's been my experience that you chew them up pretty good. Um, and you can see the adventures kind of follow a theme. You get the, the, the basic introduction, and then you get uh, like a giant oversized map. So it's really cool. Um, but this is also a good adventure as well. Uh, a couple of puzzles in it and different things. And then our index... And then here's how to continue your adventures. This is a list of, at the time that th this was produced in 2012, these are all the adventures that were out at that time and what level they are. So it's a great way to at least see, you know, oh, I, I want I want a level 4 adventure. Okay, the 13th Skull, Secrets of 13 Devilish Generations are finally revealed. And uh, it's for level 4, and it's uh, number 71. So you can go on Goodman Games, you can look for adventure number 71, and boom, there you go. Uh, these are just all a bunch of different websites of information uh, on DCC and Appendix N 
add-ons and extras. Most of these sites are still up and running. Um, and a lot of great information on here. Um, as you can see, there's quite a bit. Um, you know, here's your your dice compatible with DCC dice. I have these dice. They are awesome. Um, GaryCon, which is I'll be going to uh, next this year in 2019. Um, I plan on going to that one. And then uh, AetherCon. I think it's AetherCon. I, I don't have my book in front of me or my phone. Um, but lots of just, as always, tons of great stuff. This is a list of all the backers and everything. Um, and here's with the band. When I mentioned at the beginning of the video, uh, the Band of Adventures, that is, join us in the pages of Dungeon Crawl Classic Adventure Modules, standalone, world neutral, all new, and inspired by Appendix N. Learn more at goodmangames.com. You can go sign up and they send you swag. So I've gotten uh, t shirts, coffee mugs, uh, stickers, uh, mechanical pencils, um, pens, lapel pens, that kind of stuff. It's just great. And then, of course, they get that you always get little ribbons to put on people's badges. One says, I survived DCC. So, you know, zero level character. Um, just a quick uh, recap for like if you don't have the GM screen for your for ability scores, level thresholds, uh, difficulty levels. This is all the stuff that's already on the GM screen if you have it. And uh, it's good to have. And then there's the back, back art and the cover. So that, my friends, is DCC. And like I said, an amazing game. Um, it's, it's a D20 game. So, you know, you roll a D20, uh, plus or minus modifiers, and you either succeed or fail based on what your GM tells you. So um, I can't remember the gentleman's name, uh, but uh, Mr. Wait, let me see if I can find his name here because he's, he's got a hell of a name. Theophrastus, uh, Bombastus. Uh, I hope that's a good enough review for you, sir. I hope I didn't waste your time. I apologize. I will upload this video. Of course, my patrons will get it uh, tonight. Uh, you'll be able to see it next Monday uh, when it releases to the wild. Um, and hopefully that'll help you if you're on the fence about DCC. Hopefully uh, my positive words will influence you to pick this book up, whether it be the PDF or the paperback or hardback. It is totally worth your money, and I think if you like uh, an RPG that doesn't take its style too, too seriously and has a little bit of whimsical fun, deadly whimsical fun, you'll enjoy this game. And Hopefully you'll be a, a game master, and uh, you'll play it, and you'll run your, your friends through it, and uh, hopefully you'll build your own binder full of dead characters like I have. Um, and it's, it is a game that is near and dear to my heart. I love it dearly. Um, it is a very good game. It's a lot of fun. It does support campaign play. It is a dungeon crawler. If you want to dive through the dungeons and hack and slash your way through it, this is a great game to do it with. Um, if you want the sci-fi side of things, go look at Mutant Crawl Classic. I don't own Mutant Crawl Classic, um, but it is of the same vein and same art and same genre. Uh, not genre, but same feel to the mechanics. Um, so hopefully uh, that will that's might be something that pique your interest. I once I get a copy, a hardback copy of it, I will do a review of Mutant Crawl Classic. But I don't have it, so I can't review it. <clears throat> um, I don't. I've never even played it, as far as I know. I might have played it. I don't know. I've played a lot of games. Um, but this is my thoughts and my opinion on Dungeon Crawl Classic. Uh, it gets a, a a very highly seal of approval from Mister Mean, and and basically buy it. It's worth your money. Uh, this retails for thirty nine ninety nine, forty dollars for a book that big. Uh, Watsy, White Wolf, Fantasy Flight. Nobody puts out games like this with this quality of art, this thick, this comprehensive for forty bucks. They just don't do it. So DCC is is got the market cornered. And like I said, this is all you got to buy. You don't have to buy the GM screen. The templates are in the back. Um, you can print it out. Or photocopy it if you had to. The book will lay flat, and you can photocopy it. Um, so this is everything you need right here. Um, and in conjunction with PurpleSorcerer.com, you can print out characters, level zeros, level ones, level twos, whatever spell books, and you can go nuts, man. You can you've got all the resources you need to run this game. And 
you go to some game stores and they have discount bins of the old AD&D adventures just in there for like a dollar, sometimes even cheaper. A lot of them are for free online. You've got more adventures than you know what to do with. And if you're creative, you can throw a little twist in there, add some extra traps, make it a little whimsical, a little deadly whimsical, and um, you'll have a great, great gaming addition to your library. Um, so I hope that answers all your questions. Uh, I hope... Uh, I, I've done you a service and uh, please like and subscribe and uh, I will talk to you guys on the flip side and as always Mr. Mean says be nice <laughs>